Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Ami, for having this. Thank you, everybody, for reading. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'll read a few, uh, a few poems from some of the books that, uh, that I have. Um, this is called uh, Rattlesnake Pancakes. I don't usually take bets, but I took this one. Fatso bet me a melamite ring. I wouldn't eat a rattlesnake pancake. Normally, I am cautious. But I needed a gift for Emily Beth. And her father, being a miner, she had a thing for melamite. The thing on my plate was the color of vile cheese. And it tasted like it looked. But I got one swallow down, and then 20 followed in slow succession. I felt queasy, but Fatso never guessed. When five hours later, I was still alive. He handed over the ring. I ran to Emily Beth's mom's place on Arapaho. I found her sitting on a two-person glider on the wraparound porch. Emily Beth, I got a ring for you. Oh, blister, how did you ever afford a ring of melamite? That just heats my heart. Maybe so, Emily Beth, but are you tepid enough to wed? A gift is not a liberty blister. I'll not marry you until father life has sucked the selfish out your soul. Selfish? Selfish? I ate snake poison for you. Yeah, but you didn't die, did you? So what's the good of that? Okay. Uh, this one is called uh, Muscle Memory, uh, muscle spelled M-U-S-S-E-L. Andreas Capellanus taught that the word love comes from the word meaning to fish. I used to fish off a bridge on the eastern shore. There's a picture of me on a rampart holding a flounder. My hair is disheveled and my chest is puffed. I'm holding the flat fish by the tail and motioning to my cousin, who was to die before his daughter turned two. I had plans that night to borrow a towel and lie down under the pier with this blousy Towson girl to unleash the lost to unleash the lost longing in her face. But I had a love and could not be untrue. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, this is the poem that, I, uh, that appeared in Rhino, uh, in Rhino 2013. Um, and it's called Cranshaw on a Boat. We are floating on the chain of lakes, eating Rice Krispies out of a bucket. The sun is a soft lozenge medicating a bright red sky. Water skiers hold on to their slackening ropes like love itself. On Party Island, the icy drunks have seized control. Cranshaw has two fingers inside Margaret. No one is shocked. He was born brazen. But when he starts in on the Jews, Arnie gets mad and pushes him over the side. We let him tread water, then swing around to pick him up. Justice? No. Margaret wants him back. <laughs> uh, this is a poem called Pink. It appeared in a uh, magazine uh, put out by uh, Didi Menendez, who's a really cool woman. Uh, and her magazine is called Poets, Artists. Pink. Among the cherry trees, they fell in love. Later that month, he took her out for deep pink soup and pale pink tea. Together they peeled and fed each other pink fruit, ordered expensive pink beef, went on vacations, and viewed pink sunsets on paradise beaches. His memories included pink medicine, pink taffy, pink panties, pink lips. Hers included pink bubbles, pink slippers, pink horses, and pink sheets. Neither could imagine a heaven untinged with pink. They were right. The afterworld is splendiferously pink, the exact color of a child's new wound. Um, this one's called She Waited for Him. Station after station, she waited for him, and he waited for her. That was part of the problem, misalignment. But neither understood the geography required for connection how locus expands, how the Atlantic Ocean becomes Texas. When he held her, he thought of Racine. And when she held him, she thought of Cheyenne. Of course, there was nothing in between, except for love. But what is love? 
perfume worn by saints. So they stocked cathedrals for the odor, breathed in sandalwood, candles, holiness, mold. And when their noses were full, they took that to mean that they had found it. We all want to believe we found love, but what smells like love may not be love at all. That's the cross. It may be just worship. <laughs> Um, this one's called The Deterioration of My Handwriting. <laughs> and since I've written this poem, boy, has my handwriting <laughs> to deteriorate. It's terrible. Um, I got a D in handwriting in the third grade. I'm an old man now. That failure continues to haunt me. I saved all the letters from girls who said they loved me. As I look back on them, I can tell the ones I liked by the handwriting alone. When that girl from Princeton Junction drew hearts to dot her eyes, I lost interest immediately. I also hated her loopy cursive. Tiny, precise script in real ink on elegant paper gave me deep pleasure. Not scent, color, watermark, or sealing wax. As I became a man, I worked on improving my handwriting. Its sloppiness infuriated me. It was too revelatory. I stopped writing letters on pilfered bank deposit slips. I sprung for better pens. I adjusted my thinking to maximize the purity of my hand. The better my handwriting got, the straighter I stood. I filled a thousand avid notebooks. I took a mistress. My handwriting became my immaculate paramour. But recently, I've noticed I can no longer hold a pen with brash panache. My journals have become slapdash embarrassments. I open them to random ugliness. I don't have the solace of the integrity of the handwritten alphabet. Sterile emails and obvious fonts assail me. I don't fall in love anymore. I wish my hands could still carve the cuneiform of beauty on the waxy emptiness of thought. But all that's left me. What is left me? The precise boredom of processing processed keys. <laughs> uh, and this one's called Liz at Phil. Liz didn't steal his heart. She embezzled it. One of a number of larcenies Phil endured and forgave ever since he met her when he was 19 and she was 22. But in a bikini top and pink pedal pushers, she looked 16. So he walked taller than he was, and she pretended the hair on his lip was manly. <laughs> Love was an acid that etched their hope into a metal present. But before 10 years had passed, their loneliness had hardened into indifferent, sticky rapture and permanent part-time jobs. Abortions, bad bosses, half-hearted infidelities, <coughs> bankruptcy. Time felt like a kitten wrapped in a rattlesnake, but implacable happiness was also on its way. And this one is called Four Noble Lies. When Carlotta left me, I cried into my soup. I shriveled into harsh mathematics. A decade later, I was living on Iowa Street with Karen, she had goldfish and good taste. I loved her for her fleshy neck. We drank sinewy dos equis and played mahjong. In March, I developed that cruel facial tick. That precipitated the divorce. At the thought of losing her, my heart contracted into a span. But I knew one day I'd replace her with the brutally neutered cat. <laughs> called uh, Hitting the Wall. I hadn't seen her since Carter was president. Everything about her had turned white, even her beauty marks. I faced her strangeness and fumbled for the past, the time we went crabbing on the Chesapeake, her imitation of Barbara Mandrell, playing lawn darts at my mom's. I tried to talk, but only whispers slithered out. 
She pretended to understand what I was saying and then said, wasn't it fungible to have run across each other? Fungible, I questioned. <laughs> she slapped me hard. Then her perfume returned with a vengeance. <laughs> Um, this one's called uh, Flaubert. It's about the writer uh, Gustave Flaubert, uh, author of Madame Bovary. Um, it's called uh, Flaubert Eats Breakfast with His Mom, and there's a quote in it um, from Flaubert that comes from Flaubert's letters, which, if you were a writer, or if you love literature, or if you just love books, or anything like that, I urge you to read the letters of Flaubert. They are, they are the best. <laughs> Sorry, everything else is really under that. Uh, anyway, um, Flaubert eats breakfast with his mom. They were sitting at the breakfast table waiting for more toast. When she looked up at him and said, your mania for sentences has dried up your heart. That's not true, mother. Louise did that. And Gal in the middle class. You're just upset my fruit bowl is empty. Come, my darling. Let's take a walk in the garden and water the desert of my heart. The future may surprise us yet. Gustave, my son, my star, you're incorrigible. Yes, mother, I am. But give me your arm. The eggs will have to wait. Look, the sun is bleeding on the flowers. The clouds, soft guardians of virtue, they will protect us. God is out walking his dog. And over us, white bees hover like angels of clotted milk. This one is called, We Don't Need No Education, a title from the Pink Floyd song. You were sitting with your vexed complexion, your dour shoulders, your hoarse aloneness in the front row of my English for unwed mothers class. And I hadn't yet read your essay on miscarriages of injustice. Nor had you read Montaigne's that men are justly punished for being obstinate in the defense of a fort that is not in reason to be defended. And it wasn't yet Thursday, 2004, when we would be sitting on the curb in front of the sick community cafe where you were telling me the body is a lost temple of bliss and blister. And the smile on my face was palpably inept. And I blurted out, there's an ill energy that emanates from your precise heart that I find attractive to which you replied, editing me with a surgeon's cruel disinterest. You mean it's an attractive ill energy? And I said, yes, that's what I mean, though that, that wasn't at all what I meant. And the sun was pursuing the moon in an ineffable dance of unlikelihood and redress. And you were wearing your father's shoes, though I remember thinking, what large feet you had. <laughs> Learning later, that was unfair and untrue. Learning later that your heart, like all hearts, was fuzzy, not precise, that your candor was a sham, that you were neither a mother nor unmarried, that my interest in you was not interest at all, but usury, that I was a man not in full, but in foolishness, a false Montaigne, whose chin beard, though elegant, was the merest bravado. <laughs> With, uh, with this poem, which is called Patriot Acts, and um, I uh, like to play around with, with uh, words and titles and stuff like that. So, Acts in this poem is uh, uh, spelled A X E. Patriot Acts. A and it's an unusual poem for me because I don't usually write uh, uh, in very strict form or any kind of meter, but this has a very odd uh, meter. And um, every line, and, and it's, it's truly odd. Uh, every line is 11 syllables long, and that's not a normal length of <laughs> But it is, it is. <clears throat> a month after the Mumbai hotel attack, my three brothers, acceding to my mother's wishes to forgo further treatment, arranged for a medical van to transport her to my sister's house in South Jersey, <coughs> where we all stood around her bed like dullards in a maze. This is an act of love, they said. And I thought, well, if this is love, then everything is love. We were all there, 
the dowdy, robust husbands, the infirm wives, the incendiary kids. At the final moment, she sat bolt upright, her bloodshot eyes bulging. Her jaw jutted forth in a crazed look of anger and confusion. Then, as if in slow motion, she fell straight back against the high stack pillows and receded like a wave leading back into the ocean. Thank you.